Good morning, everyone. My name is Shane Nicholas. I'm with TAPI. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Why Inline Color Measurement is Critical for Paper Manufacturers, sponsored by XRI Pantone. Today's presenters are Manfred Binder and Matt Hartle. Manfred is the Director for New Business Development for Inline Color Measurement at x ray the market leader for color measurement. After graduating in mechanical engineering, he collected experience with optical instruments. In the last 35 years, Freddie has worked in the color business in different roles. For more than 25 years, he has been in the inline color business, where he consults many different industries all around the world on how to improve their color quality and workflows. Matt has worked at Dunpaper Natural Dam for eight years, five years as a process engineer, one year as a maintenance manager, one as operations manager, and one year as a mill manager. Matt graduated from SUNY Potts Dam and Clarkson University for physics and chemical engineering in 2013. Matt grew up in northern New York State and is married with four children. This presentation and its discussions will be held in compliance with TAPI's antitrust policy. TAPI's aim is to promote research and education and to arrange for the collection, dissemination, and interchange of technical concepts and information in fields of interest to its members. TAPI is not intended to and may not play any role in the competitive decisions of its members or their employers or in any way restrict competition among companies. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A feature on the side of your screen. We will address any questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar will be recorded. A survey link with the recording and slides will be sent to all attendees. The webinar recording will also be available on Kathy's website in the next couple of weeks. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our presenters today, Freddie and Matt. Thank you. So good morning, good day, and good evening, everybody. I've seen we have people all around the world. And welcome to this session about inline color measurement and closed loop control, especially in the paper industry. I want to start this presentation with a question. Why is it so important to talk about color? I mean, we are here and we're spending time, and why is color so important? And I've prepared some pictures for you. So this I've seen in a store, and if you look at the boxes, they have different colors. It's not representing what it's inside, but be honest, which box would you pick? Would you take the dark one or the, the more brown one, the nicer one? It looks like that the upper boxes are given back or mm, somehow strange. If you look at these boxes, a small box and a big box goes together. Is the content the same? So somehow it scares us. We are impressed by what we, what we see from the outside. So well, here I have some folders which were in our office and you see all the colors are different. Does it make a good impression for you? We always say that color is a primary quality criteria, which means everybody can see color. It's the first impression what we get. No matter if you are male or female, old or young, tall or small, whatever, everybody can see if there are color differences and this makes it so, crit makes it so critical. So, the second question is, if everybody can see color, why do we have to measure it? Well, the problem is the following. If I show you this color swatch for some minutes and try to remember it, I take it away only for a few seconds and I give you a set of another color swatches. Which one was it? And I'm pretty sure if you guess, you have a very, a very little chance to find the right one because it's the number N. So this is the only swatch which, which fits to the, to the sample which we brought. It is exactly the same color. So you see, we have no color memory. If we do not measure it, if we do not write it down in numbers, if we cannot store it, we cannot remember it. So this makes it so critical and so important to measure color and to, to be aware or yeah, to, to always create the same color for our products which we make. If I talk about color measurement, it's not only the color, the real LAB values, what I'm talking about. It's also opacity and whiteness. And you see there are some products where we measure opacity as well. For example, newsprint or tissue. Tissue is very thin. You, you need to see how, how, what's the opacity. And of course, whiteness and even brightness for all these white colors, which include optical brightness. So 
we have more than 1,000 successful installations in paper, and in total we have more than 1,500 installations. So you see our main market is the paper industry. This is where we go. Okay, so this was a little overview of what we do. Now let me introduce to you my small paper machine. You will see it in this presentation several times. I think it's a very simple paper machine and I do not have to explain normally. So on the left-hand side, you see a chest with the pulp and it goes on a screen section. It goes to the press section. We have a drying section and the reel up. I have no size press in this machine. It's a simple one just to explain what I do. What is so critical for the paper makers to produce a nice paper? Well, at the beginning, you have raw materials. If you make it from recycled paper, you see that you have many different colors in these bales. Some bales are more yellowish, some are reddish, some are bluish. You don't know what comes. You have raw materials and you see here a mine. And even in one and the same mine, you have different colors at different areas. You can imagine if you have fillers from different mines, from different suppliers, the colors will change. Then you have the dyes. The dyes should normally be constant, but especially if you dilute the dyes, maybe the dilution goes wrong. You have different dye concentrations here. You have a pH value. It also influences the color. And last but not least, you have the additives which are changing the colors. So at the beginning of the machine, you have a lot of variable products which have different color shades. You bring it in, everything changes, but at the end, you want to have a nice paper. And this makes it so tricky because the operators have to take care that all these variations at the beginning are somehow uh, brought to a standard to, to have one single color of paper at the end without any variations or with very little variations, let's say. So this, we help our customers with a so-called color measurement system. If I talk about the system, it's not only what you see here, like an instrument and a PC, and then we say, help yourself. We make a customized frame. So this is customized for every machine. We built it in the machine. We have some control boxes, which I do not need to go very much in detail, but the, the idea is that the computer can be far away from the instrument, up to 500 meters, or for American friends, 500 yards approximately. So we have a long connection over here, and of course we connect to a dyeing station or pump station to, to make these dosing pumps, uh, control the dosing pumps. And this system, which we have here, can be as a standalone system. So it, it has just some external signals, like you see here, a real change signal or a paper break signal. In case of paper break, the instrument will go away, that you can feed up the paper. And as soon as the paper is on the machine, we bring it back again. And we have a real change signal that you can see on the monitor, first reel, second reel, third reel. So this is an independent system, but you also can connect it to your DCS and we can make a totally remote control system. So everything goes through your system and nobody has to touch our computer. Everything is possible basically. So this is how the system looks like. Where can we install it on the machine? So we have three possibilities where to install the system. And the very first possibility is directly in the pulp. But here we we get color values of the pulp. Unfortunately, they do not correspond to the finished paper. Why? Because we measure here water, fibers, and the dyes. And we do not know how much dyes are fixed on the fibers and how much dyes are in the backwater. So we only can give you, we call it a pre-warning system. If something changes in the pulp, there might be a change on the paper as well. But you are at least realizing it, you, you know, okay, we have to do something over here. The second possibility is between the press and the drying section. So this is for the laminated paper, especially at the laminated paper industry, the people do not want to know how the paper itself looks like. They want to know how does the paper look like when it's glued or when it's laminated with a piece of wood. And the water in the paper here has a similar refractive index than the melamine resin. So 
we get a very uh, a, a measurement which is very good correlating to the to the laminated paper itself. So this is a, a place where we only measure in laminated paper. And last but not least, we have the real up, and we measure right before the real up. So this is for most of the paper types the finished product, and we can compare this measurement very good to the laboratory. As you have seen in my last slides, we have a, a measurement which is right on one spot. So we get very often the, the question, do we have to make a single point measurement, so just on one spot, or do we have to measure in cross direction? And let me explain you this again with my small paper machine. Normally you put the colors at the beginning of the process, either in the chest or right before the pumps, and uh, you mix it up well and it goes on the machine. So we have to assume that the color is mixed up well, otherwise you have a shaded paper, so this is for sure not working. Do you have a chance to say, okay, the left dies, uh, the, the green dies go please to the left-hand side and the blue dies go to the right-hand side? No, of course there's no chance. So you have one pulp, you have one color, you bring it on the machine, and at the end you have one color on the paper as well. Now you can say, yeah, but we have a system and we, we have a color profile and it shows a profile for the color. Yeah, that's true, you can see a color profile. But what is it really? So if you look at all the other profiles you have on the machine, for example, you have a moisture profile, you have a caliper profile, you have an opacity profile, a temperature profile, an ash content profile, all of these things influence the color. Imagine if you have a piece of paper and you make it wet, the color changes. If it's thicker, the color changes. If the opacity changes, uh, the color changes as well. Temperature and ash, everything will influence the color. So this is what we see. These are the influences on the color in cross direction, but as soon as you take the paper to the laboratory, most of these parameters are gone. The moisture will somehow um, go to a normal moisture with, at room temperature, the temperature for sure will go down. So everything goes down if you measure in an infinite layer, the opacity does not count anymore. So in the laboratory, you have one color. And this is the reason why we say it's much better to measure at a single point, then the temperature and all these parameters are much more constant in machine direction than in cross direction. And you can even compare it much better with the laboratory, because if you always measure on the drive side, you take a sample from the drive side, measure it in the laboratory, and it should fit together. It's much more difficult if you have a cross-direction measurement, if you do an average or whatever you do, it's always a mixture between anything. So single point measurement is the way how to do it. I have now some pictures just to give you an impression how it looks like on the machine. So you see, we have here the instrument, we have the paper over here. Uh, this is a dryer, I guess, and then this is the frame. So this is a customized frame. The instrument moves out if there is no paper on the machine. Here I have an instrument which you <laughs> hardly see, but I want to show you that it's very often very close to these traversing beams. So this is where the color information is basically needed. So this is where we go normally. I have a special frame here for security papers. Especially in the security papers, you have these problems that you have watermarks inside. And if you measure on the watermarks, you get um, very fluctuating measurements, so it, it does not show the real paper. The idea is we move the instrument somehow in between the watermarks and we get a stable measurement again. If you would have a traversing beam, then you would measure watermark between the watermark, half watermark, so it's, it's a, an unstable measurement. So this is especially for these security papers. And I have another speciality. This is a frame for top and bottom measurement. So especially if you have papers which has several layers, top layer, middle layer, bottom layer, whatever, you can measure both layers and you even can control both layers. So this is not only important for, uh, let's say office papers or something which should be nice, but also for this laminate, uh, for this, um, test liners, 
because at the test liners you have a nice side which is the top side and you have the back side which is somehow also brown but maybe not that nice so you can save a lot of money if the back side is not that nice not that deeply colored and you can control both sides and it still looks good if you have a corrugated board and this is how the instruments look like if you install them most of our pictures are done after installation so the, the, the instrument looks very nice, but especially, especially if you go to a tissue company, it's really dusty over there. And you see here an instrument, which was in use for not that long, one month, two months, I don't know. And it's totally dusty. And you see, this is the instrument, this is in service position. So it's moved away from the web. There is normally the, the paper is over here. It's moved away. This is the measurement aperture over here. And you see the instrument is dirty, but the aperture, it has a lid. So normally it's closed. Only for the measurement, we open for a very short time, make the flash and close it again. And during all the time, we have an air hose over here. It's difficult to see. It's this hose which goes in here. So we have an air flow inside the instrument and we have here an air knife, which keeps the aperture clean. And you see here, even behind the aperture, it's quite clean. The dust is everywhere else. So this works very nicely. Um, yeah. This is how the software looks like. And you see, it's, it's quite easy to understand. The whole software is driven by some bot buttons on the left-hand side. And you see here the L value, the A value, the B value. So lightness, red, green axis, yellow, blue axis. And you have, for example, a delta E and the opacity over here. You can have up to eight different parameters you want to see. And it's quite easy to read because the bars are showing the colors. So for example, here we were a little bit too dark, a little bit too red, but much too yellow. Then it changed to dark, to red, to yellow. And at the end, we are to yellow, to green, uh, sorry, to, to light, to green and to yellow. So even if you are not that familiar with the LAP system, you can see at one glance whether the color is good or not and in which direction you have to go. So that's quite easy and quite simple to see. So far, I was talking about color measurement. Now we go a little bit to the closed loop control. Closed loop control is basically the same. You have the machine, you have the measurement at the end, you see the LAB values on the computer, you know where you want to be, and you know the actual values. And then we calculate how much do we have to change the dice to go back to target. We send this information either directly to a pumps kit. Sometimes we go also through the DCS system of the customer. The pumps are adjusted. We feed the dice somewhere at this point. I show you later a bit more where and how and what we can do. With this new adjustment, it directly changes the color on the paper. It takes a while until we see it again, and then we can make the next control step. So this is this control loop what we have over here. And this works very nice. So why is it so difficult to control the colors? If you look at this, this is what some, somebody or what, what everybody would like to have. You have one color which goes on the L axis, you have one color which goes on the A axis, and you have another color which goes to the B axis. But this doesn't work. You, you see that the L axis, I have even written a blue because this is a very typical system people use for brown paper. So the blue will, of course, change also the p-value. So in fact, every color changes every value. And this makes it complicated. If you want to have it uh, more red, you can add the red, uh, you can increase the red, but maybe then it's going darker and uh, maybe the red also influences the p-value. It's not that easy. It's even more complicated if you have an OBA. So everything is influencing everything. And this is why it's not that easy to make it manually or even to use a PID controller. This doesn't work at all because the, all these three PID controllers would influence each other. The only thing what works is really a mathematical model based on a color matching system. And then we calculate how do we have to change the dice to go to the target. So with that said, what is possible? What do you need if you need to have a good control? So with three colorants, example, red, yellow, and blue, you can always go to, uh, to the target. Additionally, we can control 
uh, OBA, but we have to say in the white paper, typically a uh, blue or violet and the OBA is used. So there are just two dyes or two pigments in this case even, and the OBA. So with these correct colorants, we can adjust the LAB values that we always come down to zero or very, very close to zero. If we have less than three dyes, we can also do a closed loop control, but we cannot go directly to zero, but very close to, to zero. So what we do very often, especially if you talk about liner board, if you get a pulp, which is already too dark, well, we cannot make it lighter. So the only thing what we can do is we switch off the darkest color in, in this example here, it would be the blue. And with the red and the yellow, we try to control the A and B value. So we let the L value float because it's the only chance we have and make the color somehow precise, the A and the B value. And there is one more thing. Um, the dye stuff supply is responsible for dye and injection points. That means if you use dyes from a certain supplier, I do not want to mention our name because we work with all of the dye suppliers and we are all good friends. We get from them the calibration samples so we know how the dyes look like. You get a fully prepared database which you can use. You do not have to prepare any samples or something like this. And together with the dye, uh, with the dye supplier, we define the point where to inject the dyes. So this is a, a a very important thing because the dye supplier knows the chemistry best, the chemistry of his dyes and typically also the chemistry of the paper machine. He can decide how long his dyes need to react with the fibers, where can we inject the dyes. If somebody goes for it, it's always important to say, okay, um, why, why should I go for it? Why should I put the color matching system in or a closed loop control system in because you want to save money. And this is not that easy because paper is not paper. So I have specified here several industries. We have a test liner, so basically the brown paper. We have colored, for example, office paper. I have a colored tissue, white paper, security paper, laminated paper. And the first thing, which is for all of these uh, paper types uh, valid is of course, you improve the quality. As you will always go to the target, the paper you deliver is always right and the customer basically cannot complain. If he complains, you can prove how your, your reel looked like and you can see what, what's the problem of the customer. All of these paper mills have also shorter transition and startup times. And I made it a bit bigger at the laminated paper because for them, it's the biggest advantage. Sometimes in the laminated paper industry, you have uh, very long transition times because you have to laminate the paper in between, which takes between 15 and 45 minutes. So <laughs> you, you shut down the paper machine for 45 minutes to wait for the result from the laboratory, and then you do another trial. If you can save some of these trials, it's of course a big winning for them. And in my next slide, I also show you why other industry or uh, other papers are profiting from that. So why they have also shorter transition times. I will go to this in the next slide. You have dye savings. This is the over next slide, which I show you why you have dye uh, savings. But this is of course, typically only for the test liner colored paper and colored tissue. On the white paper, you save pigments and OBA. Yeah. And then we have a waste storage and the waste handling. Everything what you do, which is not on color, is a basically a recycling material, which you, which you recycle again. But you have to take it out. You have to store it. You have to bring it into the process. So if you have not that much waste material, the waste handling is much easier. You don't need that much space. And to recycle it, it's also much easier. And at the end, we have a more efficient use of these uh, recycled materials because if you have a closed loop control, you just feed the, the recycled material or the waste basically in and the closed loop control, we keep the color constant. So I promised you now to show you how you can save uh, on, on, the shade, on the transition times. 
So if you make a paper, if you let's say start up the machine or go from one shade to another shade, the paper makers have to adjust different things on the paper machine. They have to adjust the flows, the width of the paper, the caliper, the chemistry, pH values, a lot of things. And after they have done everything, they change or they adjust the color. So they always say everything changes the color, but the color will not change anything else. So this is the idea behind if you have set up everything, you finally adjust the color and the other parameters will stay constant. So far, so good, but what do we do? Basically, we cannot do anything at the beginning of the process. We cannot adjust the flows or whatever, so this has to be done by the paper makers anyhow. But at a certain point, they know now we are close to target. In approximately 10 minutes, we will have the right paper, basically, but not the color. So they switch on the closed loop control, which means they just press a button and say start. With this done, with this work, the closed loop control starts and it adjusts the color automatically. So typically, if the paper makers are finished over here, the color is also finished. They are on color without doing anything, just pressing a button. That means here is this period where you save time and which brings you the money. So you are much faster in startup and much, uh, much faster from shade changes from one to the other color. And on my next slide, I show you how you can save dyes, especially for the brown paper now. I have just taken one value, it's the L value. So let's say we may want to make a brown paper, which has a L value, a target value of 58. Especially in the brown paper, you have very huge tolerances of plus minus two, for example. So what happens? We start with the production, but paper makers always like to have the paper more saturated, more good looking. So they add more and more dyes and the color becomes darker. But at a certain point, controlling comes over and they say, wow, we are far too dark. We, the costs are much too high because they are using more dyes. So they just change it to the lighter part. But of course, over time, paper makers add more and more and more and it gets darker again. So this is not a question of some minutes, it's a question of some days, yeah? They always like to have this nice color. So the dye consumption increases again. Now, if you look at the customer, the customer says, your, all of your paper is inside tolerance. But if you look at this point over here and at this point over there, if I want to print on it, I got different colors. So I don't care which color I get, but I want to have the same color. And this is where the closed loop control helps. If you have a closed loop controls, the variations are very little. So our customers tell us it's around 0.1 to 0.2 maximum, even if you use recycled materials. So if you have a lot of different colors at the beginning. So you see, everything is very close. You have plus minus 0.2 and now, um, with this you have very low tolerances. So your customers are happy and you can do now one trick and you say, okay, I make a new target and this target is 59.5. It's still within tolerances. And now you have a paper, which is also very constant, but lighter. And the dye suppliers tell us if you make uh, the Delta L one point lighter, it saves you approximately 7% of dyeing costs. So if you go to 1.5%, it's approximately 10%. If you have dying costs of 1 million US dollars or maybe two or 3 million, it depends on the mill. You can imagine you save 10%. It's a nice money per year. So if you look at the advantages of the automatic closed loop color control, it provides on-time process correction. So it, it does everything by itself. It minimizes the startup and the shade change times, which I told you before, by doing everything in parallel to the operators which are setting up the machine. With this said, it minimizes the off-spec production. So you are quicker on target, you have less waste. It improves the uniformity and the quality of the paper, which is for sure good of your customers. And it optimizes the dye usage, which we have seen before. It takes the guesswork out of the process. This is a very nice thing, which I did not mention so far. Even if you have an experienced paper maker, he may tell you, I know what to do. I know that I have to increase the red and I have to decrease the blue. How much? Yeah, maybe, maybe 
ah, uh, let's let's try this two at the beginning. Uh, maybe another half percent. So it needs several steps to go to the right amount. The closed loop control calculates that you need 2.75% more red and minus 1.63% blue. And then you are on the right color. And this is the big advantage. It takes the guesswork out of the process. And of course, the operators can focus on much more important things. So how do we do these uh, connections. So we say never inject uh, concentrated dyes directly into the process because it can cause marble effects. So it's always good to dilute it, um, but these pre-dilution, so if you dilute it and then you, you dose the diluted dyes, it has some disadvantages because one thing is about the accuracy, how accurate you make it if you do it manually. If you have an automatic dilution system, it's really cost intensive. It costs most of the times much more than a closed loop control. Then you have problems with the diluted dye because there is always a precipitation. Very often these urate crystals are sticking somewhere on the tubes, on the pumps, whatever. So the, the sh shelf time, let's say, of the dye is going down and uh, it causes always problems. So the better way um, use concentrated dyes. We pump concentrated dyes. And if you say, oh, but I make a white paper and I have very little uh, flows of the blue and of the violet, we have pumps which have uh, 0 to 0 0.6 liters per hour. So this is 0 to 20 ounces per hour with a ratio from 1 to 10,000. So there is a lot of zeros behind the comma or behind the point, sorry, to where, which is the lowest volume. So it's one drop in or a few drops in an hour, but continuously died. It's not one drop now and one drop in 20 minutes. It's continuously feed it into the process. So this works very nice. Um, with this, we have the best uh, achievable storage stability of the dyes because it's the concentrated dye like it comes from the dye supplier. You can keep it on your storage for half a year. You can keep it in the pump for half a year. It doesn't matter. It's not a difference. Uh, transport and dilution water will be diluted after this dosing point, so right before the injection point, and this avoids marble effects. And I show you how this works. So we have the dye, the concentrated dye, we have the pump over here, and then we add the water afterwards. And if you add, for example, 30 liters per hour or eight gallons per hour, you have a dilution from one to 1,800. So it's it's for sure no more marble effect. And with this, we have basically two ways. If you have more dyes than pumps, then you have three pumps, for example, and they have a very short line over here and a long dilution line over here. Or if you make the other way around, oops, uh, too quick. If you have, let's say for, for brown paper, you have always the same dyes, you have three pumps, you can make a long line over here and this line is very short. But basically you have the concentrated dyes over here and it goes directly into the pump and uh, it's, it's mixed up over here. So this is how the paper machine looks like, just the beginning of the paper machine. You have the white water over here. This is the circulation of the water. Um, we have a machine chest and then we have two ways how to add the dyes. It can be either here in the thick pulp or you can also include it in the thin pulp. And this is a question which we should discuss with your dye supplier. What is the best way? Because it depends on the machine, it depends on the circuit, it depends on the chemistry. Um, we have some proven pump types. So this is just some pictures here. We have uh, Brown and Lupis, Joke pumps, Nice, expensive, very accurate, but very expensive. We also use these Grundfos pumps. This is at the moment, I would say the most sold pumps. It's uh, uh, much cheaper, very reliable. And if you if you want to replace a pump, you just take it out, put the new pump in and you do not have to repair it basically on the, on the line. You just put in a new pump and then you can repair the, the old pump. And what we also have are these Brun and Lübe pumps. So, uh, sorry, um, Watson Malo pumps, it's a peristaltic pump. Also very nice for, for you can use different hoses to have different uh, dye amounts to be, to be pumped. 
Okay, so now I want to hand over to Matt Hartle. He is working at uh, DanPEP, a natural dam. He is using our instrument for several years, so since 2015, I have calculated, and the closed loop control since 2017. And he wants to tell you something about his experiences. So, Matt, up to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, our brief history of natural dam uh, done paper. We've been making colored paper here um, since the 1980s. Uh, it's, we average more than 10 color changes per day. Uh, historically, it was a batch dyeing process. So, so all of the dye, regardless if it was two pounds of dye or 350 pounds of dye, it was all added in the pulper. Um, so that resulted in uh, large variances depending upon operator skill and you know as your as your broke comes back to the pulper you have to continually uh, change the amount of dye that you're putting into the pulper to maintain a passing color value on uh, for the customer so we had large large differences uh, reel to reel or uh, run to run so the color value another another issue we had the color value that we were measuring um, that the customer specified that was tested at the top of the reel so we would get one measurement we take a tear off the top of the reel when we turned it up and we would uh, assume that whole reel was in color in, in spec now without any online measurement the bottom or the middle of the reel could be out of specification that we didn't know so when the customer was converting it um, they would notice that and, and it's not something we could catch on site uh, the last issue we had, and it was probably the biggest issue, the operator skill and knowledge had to be vast. So um, making more than 300 different colors uh, in, our, in our palette, some operators may only see a color once a year, uh, depending on their shift cycle. And, um, you know, so there was, there was a, lot of, a lot of operator knowledge needed to maintain good color value. Uh, and that was something we had struggled with. Uh, let's see, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so, right, so it's part of the challenge is like I discussed, it, difference in color between pulper, between pulpers in the reel, which results in guesswork, right? So we take a, you can take a sample out of the pulper that you've already dyed up. Um, you make a little hand sheet, shoot the color, uh, assume in, assume you're on color. Uh, there's always color changes reeled, uh, from the pulper all the way to the reel when you finish the paper. The dye doesn't always you know, it cleaves off at some parts in the process, refining changes the color value. Um, so there was always guesswork between the reel and the pulper. Um, our color palette was opening up. Uh, customers wanted different colors, more diverse colors. Uh, so our, we started making more and more colors that were slightly different shades than each other. Uh, the color technicians put a lot more stress on them. Uh, the wide variations from reel to reel and in the same reel due to batch dyeing in the pulper. Uh, and we had more customers requesting colored paper. So the color runs were longer, um, which meant we would have more color changes, more changeovers resulting in more waste uh, due to color changes. All right, so we looked around, uh, we figured that probably the solution was using some type of online measurement. Uh, we hadn't really gotten to the closed loop color control portion yet. So we had looked at a couple of different companies and we uh, ended up settling on uh, X-ray system. Uh, they brought in a, uh, uh, a uh, test unit basically so we could mount it on the real section, make sure it was gonna work. We had our doubts, but it, it, it worked well. Uh, so the uh, Inline close inline measurement we had. Uh, we could set tolerances for each color. Uh, the color was red in real time every 30 seconds, so we had a very good understanding on what was happening in the reel. And once we installed the closed loop color control, we could meter the dye based on color tolerances. So we were able to stay within uh, target, a uh, much tighter ta to target, um, which increases customer satisfaction. Right. So we reduced our color change times. Um, we eliminated off-color material mid-run, so that would be the issue with batch dyeing uh, in the middle of a run. Once you're on color, typically you stay on color unless there's an issue back in the pulper when they're putting their batch dye in, and then we would jump off color mid-run, not know about it. So the inline color control solved that problem, and then 
uh, we did experience a lot of die savings as well. A lot of it was due to running to target or running half a point light. Um, uh, operators generally, you know, you can always you can always add more die, die. You can't take it out. So they would, you know, we would have our operators would add die, and we would constantly be running about a point to two points deep. Um, and uh, and and that's that's an issue with you know with with trying to save die. Uh, if you're doing batch dyeing. So the inline color control and closed loop color control, we can dye up right in the thin stock uh, for the light shades and we don't have to dye up in the pulper. And uh, we save a lot of dye by running our depth to target. We'll go to the next slide. All right, so these are some of our results we, we experienced. So our color change waste, we had a 50% reduction in color change waste. So that's true even today. Um, it's nothing to take, you know, five minutes to get on color. Um, on any of the pastels or mid-tones. Uh, deep tones, we still batch dye in the pulper um, just because of the affinity of fiber uh, to dye. So you have a better uh, adherence in the thick stock, but on all of the pastel and mid-tones, it's a quick dyeing process. Um, our off-quality color complaints, off-color quality complaints were reduced by 95%. Um, pastel and mid-tones are fully dyed at the machine. So like I said, we send white pulpers and the X-ray system does the rest. Uh, the deep tone colors, we do batch dye in the pulper still. About 90% of the dye goes in the pulper and then we do the final trimming on the machine. Uh, and one of the biggest things we've noticed you know, from, a, from a management and a, um, operator standpoint, operator stress is decreased. We have, they feel more confident running color. Um, it's, it's certainly easier. There's uh, less call-ins at night because the operators can't get on color. That's virtually disappeared. Um, all in all, it's, it's been a huge success for us and we're, we're glad to have found the system and, and worked with X-Rite to, to uh, um, get the project approved and, and uh, operational. So that's, uh, that's, that's my, uh, my experience with the system. And um, I don't, you, do you wanna close it out, Freddie? um thank you very much it was uh, interesting to listen to you i i knew that it's like this but it's always always good if you hear it from a customer um so thank you very much thank you very much um i think we can open this now to questions from the audience thank you freddie and matt um the first question that i have is what are options what options are there for customers with an x right online measurement system currently but no closed loop system well it's easy you can always upgrade your system to a closed loop control system we use exactly the same instrument it's just basically a software option and of course you, we need to connect somehow to pumps so what i didn't specify so far we sell, of course, not, not our own pumps, but we, we trade with pumps. We have these three pump types, which I've shown you. But if you have pumps already installed, which you somehow can remote control, we can use your pumps. We connect to your pumps, typically through the DCS system. And then we have a closed loop control. So it's this is very easy to upgrade. Thank you. The next question. Um, it looks like it's in regards to color change. It says two to three dyes. Does DCS adjust automatically or is a manual starting point effective? No, you can really start from scratch. So if you if you start up your machine, if you have no color at the machine at the moment, you set up your machine and when it takes you, it depends how long, how fast your machine is running. If it takes 10 more minutes until everything is fixed, you start the closed loop control, it starts pumping the dyes, and it goes very quick to the, the to the color you want. So we, we can even make a color change in automatic mode from red to green, which of course is not very effective, but it can be done by the closed loop control and even in a very quick way. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on to that, Freddie. There's there's uh, recipes for every um, color that you make. So if you make, a, if you make like, a, dark red and that's your color there's a there's a preset recipe that you can enter into the uh, closed loop system so that when you hit start it starts out at those at those metering levels and then it adjusts from there it doesn't have to start at zero and all of your recipes can be saved in the system thank you man freddie next question a key difference between erx50 and new xra50 
Uh, it's the XRA45. Sorry, it's some people say it's a downgrade, but it's not. I wanted to come away from this. Uh, what is a 50? What is it? So I thought 45. It indicates the optics. It's a 45-0 optics. What is the advantage? Basically, the ERX50 was running out of parts, so we had to develop something new. And we have some new advantages, and I will just point out two important ones. First of all, we make a temperature measurement with it. What is the advantage? If you, I, I have shown you before that color measurement is also depending on the temperature, especially if you make brown, red, yellow, orange colors. You have a certain thermochromism, so if you measure the hot color on the machine, it's not necessarily the same than you have it later on in the laboratory. So if the temperature of the paper is changing, the color may change as well. At the moment, it's uh, it's just uh, information for you, so you can see that the color at the machine, uh, the temperature at the machine has changed. Maybe this causes a color change as well. In the future, we plan to, yeah, to uh, I do not want to, to tell too much, but we plan to correct this somehow so that we, we can find a correlation between the temperature and the, and the color and we can recalculate how it looks like in the laboratory. But this is future, this is not available right now. So at the moment, we have the measurement, the temperature measurement. And the second point which I want to point out is the dirt detection. So we have built in a tool to measure how dirty the instrument is. It saves you basically two in two ways. First of all, some people have a, a maintenance routine that every month they clean the instrument. It could be that after one month it's really dirty and you have to clean it. It could be that after one month it's, it's totally clean and there is no need to clean it. So it helps you to to see when it is necessary. And if there is happening something on the machine, I don't know, a special paper break or whatever, where it's really dusty and the instrument is dirty, it gives you a warning. It tells you, hey, the instrument needs to be cleaned. And with this frame, it's easy to go to the instrument, take it from the running machine. You have a handle where you basically can bring it out. You can clean it very easy. You need a screwdriver for that. Calibrate it and bring it in again. And then you have a stable measurement. So it ensures basically that the measurements are correct, especially in, in terms of dust and dirtiness. So these are these two main advantages. There is some more advantages. We have a new power board, which is much more reliable. Some connections are made better. It's easier to service. We have uh, the plugs are made different because the old ones was difficult to plug in. With the new one, it's much more easier. Okay, this, these were the main issues of the new instrument. And of course, it's serviceable for a minimum the next 10 years. Thank you. What is the max amount of dyes that the DCS can use, for example, if a shade has five dyes in its dye package? Uh, we can we can use, uh, I think, up to five or six dyes. But there is uh, one thing. There are only three dyes in automatic mode. The problem is we have a L, a A, and a B value. So we have three values which we measure. So with three values, we can control three dyes. If you have four dyes, then one die goes always as a manual die. That means, let's say, you have a, a make it simple, a yellow, a blue, a green, and a red. Yeah, with blue and yellow, you can make a green as well. So let's say we make the green in a manual die, and the the yellow, the blue, and the red will control the color. If for any reason you say I need to have the green die now as a as an automatic die, you can switch it. You can say, okay, I want to switch the green to an automatic die and the blue to a manual die. And this goes automatically on the fly. But three dies are controlled in automatic mode, and the other ones are uh, manual dies which just run with a constant amount. Thank you. What if DCS and auto line don't correlate? Is this a cal calibration issue? Can you repeat this? What is DCS and? Sure. What if DCS and auto line don't correlate? Is this a calibration issue? 
Ah, okay. Uh, the outer line normally is measuring a little bit different. So you have a, a layer of papers which is uh, behind the paper you want to measure. If this paper is somehow not exactly the same what you have on the machine, of course the values are just close to, to what they should be, let's say. So this is sometimes which we face up as a problem. You should try to make um, uh, a real measurement on a, a laboratory system. It could be a LRAFO, could be anything else, it doesn't matter. It, with a real infinite layer. So take the paper, fold it together, measure it, and then it should be very close. It should correlate very close to our systems. So it doesn't mean that it's exactly the same absolute values, but if you correlate the inline measurement to the laboratory measurement, then if the inline shows you 0.5 units lighter, the laboratory should also say you, tell you 0.5 lighter. There is also some, sometimes we see some issues that a customer is doing this correlation process at every real change, and he correlates plus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.1, minus 0 0.2, plus 0 0.1. I mean, this is a difference which you have in the paper. If you take the paper and if you measure at several spots on the, in the laboratory, you have easily plus minus 0 0.2 units difference. And of course, this is also the correlation which we have between inline and laboratory. It doesn't make sense. Only if it's constantly above, let's say, 0 0.5 for more than one measurement, then you should control it and then it should be constant to the laboratory. But we have, we have sometimes these issues with these auto lines of whatever you have, where you, you cannot do a real measurement, opacity measurement on a real stack layer. So they, they have always these papers behind and then it's, it's of course uh, different and uh, the measurements could be a little bit different. But the question is which measurement is more correct? So if you have the wrong paper as a backing or if you calculate the infinite layer based on black and white. Thank you. Uh, next question. How much typical cost savings in dyes in terms of percent of cost per ton reduction can be gained from upgrading from manual to online control systems? Um, so I showed you the picture before where I say if you go to 1.5 points higher, you save 10% of the dyeing costs. And this is really true. You can ask your dye suppliers, you can, yeah, you can ask anybody. So if you if you save one point in lightness, it's seven percent dying costs. If you save one point five percent, it's uh, approximately ten percent dying costs. So this can be easily calculated. If you take your annual dying costs, then you know ten percent can be saved. But it's not only the savings in the dying costs. I think much more interesting is even the the fact that you do these transition times in fifty percent of the times. The customer complaints, all of the things Matt also said. We, when we sell a closed loop control system, I have never heard a customer who said the ROI was more than six months. The worst ROI I have ever heard was when we have sold a, a system for pipe measurement, so no closed loop control. It's just this pre warning system, which I told you. And then the customer told me he saves with every shade change just two minutes. And I thought, wow, two minutes is nothing. But at the end, it resulted in a ROI of 8.6 months, which is not that bad. Yeah? It's less than a year for a very simple system. And with the closed loop control, I would say maximum six months you have uh, an ROI. And if somebody wants to calculate it, we have an ROI calculator. I can uh, send it to you. You can play yourself because I know that people do not want to share their internal numbers, but it's an Excel sheet. You can play yourself and you see if you have that tons of paper, if the paper has a certain cost and if your shade change times is typically 20 minutes, then you get an ROI. And you can say, okay, maybe it's not 20, but 25 minutes. And then you see how much it changes. It's interesting. Thank you. Is calibration of a scanner or DCS required when a color is replaced by a similar color so as to sense the correct hue? Uh, 
the calibration is required in a certain time. So we have an internal calibration, which is done every, normally I, I switch it to every 15 minutes, but this you do not see, it's done automatically. The sensor itself should be calibrated every two months. This is what we recommend to the customers. If you if you have a really dirty system, like in the tissue, it's it's just, it's really dusty. You have to do it more often. But uh, let's say every month, every two months, you should calibrate the system externally, which means you have a white tile. You just slip it on the instrument and it's calibrated. It takes, the calibration itself takes maximum two minutes. Okay, you have to pick up the tile somewhere. You have to bring it back 15 minutes in total. So this is the calibration which you have to do on the instrument. The instrument is measuring quite stable. So even after one month, if you do the same production, if the instrument is treated well, you should get the same readings. You do not have to calibrate it again. But if you mean this correlation between inline and the laboratory, this you should do for every color. So you cannot, uh, you cannot do it for a blue color and then expect that the red color has the same correlation factors, uh, it's, it's different. So this, this correlation between inline and laboratory measurement has to be done for each color, but it will be stored in the database. And the next time you produce the same color, the same correlation factors are used automatically. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Not sure if we can disclose this publicly, but uh, the question is, does the X, does x right work with both Hunter Lab and LAB? We can work with Hunter Lab values. We can work with uh, C Lab values. Yes, we have all these calculations in our in our mathematics. So this is just the mathematics of the computer. We can use delta E two thousand. We can use CMC. We can use D ninety nine. We can use. We have many systems inside. But Hunter, yeah, for sure, we can use. Or, or we are Great. using. We are using. It's not just we can do it. It's included in the software. Thank you, Freddie. We're about a minute out. Does anyone else have any other questions? I'll give a couple more seconds. Thank you again, Freddie, Matt, and X-Right Pantone for today's presentation. Um, as a reminder to all attendees, a survey with a link to the recording and slides will be sent to all of you in a few days. Uh, we encourage you to complete it so that we can get proper feedback on how to better serve you through these presentations. Thank you, everyone, for your time. This concludes today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.